sore Bapak dan Ibu sekalian. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Di sini masih dalam rangkaian acara um, International Conference and Workshop on Artificial Intelligence, Remote Sensing for Forestry Applications. Um, sekali lagi, izinkan saya untuk mengantarkan diskusi di uh, breakout room uh, uh, yang nomor 4 ini. Desert assessment, begitu kita punya empat uh, prominent speakers. So we have four prominent speakers here. Um, I will uh, try to briefly introduce uh, each of our speakers. Um, the first uh, speaker will be Dr. Uh, Parwati Sofan. Um, um, she is um, a researcher at Lapan. Um, she will um, bring or she will uh, deliver a presentations on uh, detections of tropical peatland fires from using multiple satellite images. The second speaker is uh, Dr. Yeni uh, Fetrita, um, from also a researcher uh, from Lapan. The, presen the presentation will be uh, on, the, uh, on the topic of evaluating multi-sensor data for productions of burn area maps in Indonesian peatland, uh, assessing uh, seasonality uh, differences. The third speaker is Dr. Agus Mariono, um, a scientist from um, Sekolah Vokasi Gajah Mada University. The presentation is uh, about uh, drone susur sungai cegah banjir bandang. Uh, and the last and the final speakers, um, last but not least, is Dr. Harkunti Pertiwi Rahayu, um, uh, a lecturer and researcher at the Faculty of um, Arsi uh, Architecture and uh, Planning at uh, uh, ITB, Bandung Technological Institute di Bandung. Um, now I will invite uh, Ibu Parwati to, you know, to deliver your presentation. Ibu, silahkan. Um, you have uh, 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Pak Arif. Allow me to share my screen first. Mm, this one. Sudah terlihat, Bu. Silakan. Yes. Okay. Um, how about my voice? Is it uh, clear enough um, in this volume? It's clear. Yep. Okay. Yeah. You're good. good to go, Bu. All right. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thanks to the WRI for inviting me to present in this session. And I uh, would like to... Um, this is actually um, my research during my uh, candidature in University of South Australia. So during this um, presentation, uh, from the title that uh, I want to present today, um, there is three keywords actually uh, that we can uh, grab from this title. First is the tropical peatland, and the second is the recording in progress. Fires, fires, which is uh, specifically for the um, peatland fires, and the third is the satellite images. So here is the outline of the present presentation. First, I'm gonna uh, brief introduce Recording stopped. the tropical peatland and the peatland fires, and then the research gaps and the questions. And the third is about the principle uh, for fire detection using remote sensing data. And the and then the establishment of the tropical peatland combustion algorithm, or we call it as the topical, and the result validation using the Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2, and also the assessment of the hotspot uh, active or active fires from fears to the result of the topical algorithm and the summary. Okay, um, first, uh, let me uh, show you about the peatland. This is uh, for those who hasn't been to peatland before. So uh, this picture, actually, um, I take, uh, I took uh, in the 
Kalimantan. Um, so this picture, the peatland has been used as plantation, as you see from, let me, uh, okay, on the landscape. This is the plantation, palm oil here. And uh, you can see the depth uh, was about uh, two meter. And the pit here um, uh, was formed uh, by the remains of plants here and the acid water. Uh, this uh, actually without oxygen of per thousand of year and the pit uh, serves as the carbon storage. So here, um, the carbon uh, that's stored in the peat actually is about 30% of the soil carbon and more than 50% of the atmospheric carbon. So the, this is a big, a huge resource of the carbon in our peatland. Okay. Then uh, the second um, keywords is fires. See uh, here in a fire condition, peatland uh, fires consists of two uh, stage, which is flaming and smoldering. In this research, uh, the highlight will be on the smoldering fires, which mostly occur in small areas as a result of the agriculture practice uh, of the um, local farmer. And the smoldering has a lower uh, temperature rather than flaming. This is um, will be below than 500 Kelvin, while for the flaming is about 700 to 1000 Kelvin. It can last days, two weeks, a month, or even a year. And before uh, it's expanding to a large area, so we need to monitor the smoldering uh, pit fires. That's the uh, significance of uh, the monitoring. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, here, the satellite remote sensing have been utilized for biomass burning detection more than one decade. And there are two types of data based on the spatial resolution. First is the uh, low spatial resolution. Uh, this figure, I. Uh, this is the example of the first images, first image, and some facts that uh, we can grab on this picture is that it can cover a large area here. Um, at least two times per day, we get this uh, first data, and in some reference uh, from the spectral uh, characteristic, the middle infrared and thermal infrared. Um, that uh, acquire that con consists in the um, fierce data can detect the smoldering and flaming. So the spectral characteristic um, can able to um, detect smoldering and flaming using this kind of uh, data. We call it from the hyperspectral data. However, it needs to be assessed, assessed, assessed. Uh, for detecting small fires like this um, in tropical pit environment. So the second one is this, um, the example of um, Landsat images. And um, its spatial resolution is about uh, 12 times more bigger than fears. So uh, here you can see more detail uh, land cover and the possible to detect small fires here. This is acquired in, in the same day. Okay. So, uh, however, um, the Landsat data only available for 16 days and some reference uh, utilize uh, short wave infrared uh, for flaming detection. So it doesn't have middle infrared. So, while the uh, smoldering detection is still in lack on research, 
we try to develop the algorithm to um, detect smoldering fires using the spectral um, spectral of NZ8, uh, which is sphere reflectance and thermal reflectance, thermal um, thermal infrared uh, brightness temperature. So this is the gap. So uh, we still lack on the smoldering detection for small fires in tropical. A research questions. We have here three three items here. First, is it possible to map flaming and smoldering pitland fires from the moderate spatial resolution with only sphere well and thermal infrared uh, and using daytime? So the second one is how to optimize the use of global active fires product from low spatial resolution satellite sensor, for example, using the uh, fierce activifiers to guide uh, the disaster management agency to efficiently conduct uh, ground validation and subsequent suppression. And the third, to obtain pitland fire information at higher spatial and temporal resolution than I said eight, uh, we have here Sentinel-2, but without a tier information. So only by using a uh, sphere, short wave infrared. Okay. Then um, this is the principle of the fire detection using remote sensing data. So the graph here is the a spectral radiance simulated using modrons with the moderate resolution atmospheric uh, transmission uh, model for peatland here uh, with limited um, vegetation. This is a simulation. And the simulation was based on albedo of 0 0.1, 0 0.1, with an assumption of emissivity of 0.9 of our burning peatland at the temperature of 300 Kelvin. Uh, actually, this is the background of Earth, which has 300 Kelvin for the average, and then uh, 360 Kelvin for the um, smoldering fires, and then 450, 500 into 1,000 uh, Kelvin. And the here, uh, as you can see here, um, three three micron and four micron is the it's called as the middle infrared. All of the um, face of the um, peatland fires covered in this region, it can uh, detect smoldering. It has three hundred six. The Kelvin to 100, uh, 1000 Kelvin here, based on the uh, radiance energy. While for the tier thermal infrared, we can also use the this tier to detect the small ring here. This is 360 60 Kelvin and to uh, 1000. But here, uh, it's about two micron to two point five something here. Uh, it's actually um, so so uh, weak to detect the smoldering fire. As you see here, the background and the uh, smoldering uh, temperature has a similar um, pattern here that we can't just only uh, have a little. Uh, distance to 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 use uh, this uh, region to map the to detect the smoldering fires. While for the um, flaming, it doesn't uh, have any problem at all for detecting the high temperature. So th this is the basic of uh, the basic principle how we can uh, use this spect spectral characteristic to. To, to map or to detect the fire. Okay. 
So we have here the drone images here for the um, here is the burn burn area and the smoldering pitland here, and and then we do also ada, bro. Uh, collection. Ada, ada, bro. Tadi untuk untuk supaya tidak ada bias. Sorry. Some noises here. Okay. So we also collected some field measurement uh, using um, this is the, the temperature, infrared temperature. And we got the um, result for the smoldering area and burn area. There is a significant difference for the temperature. Okay. And then the previous result, Elfit, also mentioned that uh, the flaming can be easily to be detected, but uh, for the smoldering, it has less separability with the background. This is the challenge uh, that we are trying to face. Okay. And we also have um, some data that uh, for the drone images. Recording in progress. Um, in the all over smoldering area and the burn area here. And for the um, flaming, uh, because we can't uh, directly go to the field uh, under the flaming condition. So we only um, uh, only de delineate the flaming area by using Landsat images or uh, other images, for example, from the Sentinel-2. So the graphs here is the extraction of these um, data from the Landsat band. And said eight bands. So uh, here we got that the um, ratio of band seven, band seven um, used to separate uh, combustion area and non combustion area. The non combustion area here is the uh, burn area. Okay. So based on the uh, data collection that we um, uh, collect in the field and also uh, integrated with the satellite images. We develop our uh, algorithm, which called as tropical peatland combustion. So we use the SWIR 2, band 7 of Landsat, and SWIR 1, band 6 of Landsat to uh, separate the combustion pixel and non-combustion pixel, and then use the band one to separate the atmospheric condition into clear and smoky area. And uh, the band tier to also uh, be used to detect smoldering. Okay. Detail algorithm can be seen in this, um, I mentioned a uh, publication here. You can check, right? And then we uh, try to compare our algorithm with the other uh, algorithm that uh, developed for the detection for forest fire in a global scale, which is not uh, di different, not uh, divided, uh, not the not aimed to detect smoldering or flaming in our pit lamp. So here is the result. So th this, this is the RGB of Landsat. And then Goli is the name of the other um, algorithm that we, we compared with. And this is the detection of the Goli result. And this is our algorithm, the topical algorithm here, which uh, cover more um, fires here. This is the difference. The magenta one is from the goalie and the, the blue uh, cyan color is the, from our algorithm. And we have um, drone data from the um, drone, drone, drone images here. So in, in this uh, cyan area, the cyan color, actually is the smoldering. Uh, we can see some smokes there and the ash um, 
above the surface here. Okay. So the difference is the um, global or um, glo global activifier algorithm, mostly for uh, flaming detection, but while for our algorithm also consi consists of uh, smoldering and flaming. So we have limited uh, uh, problem for the uh, small smoldering by um, detect uh, small, very small area, less than one one pixel of uh, uh, Landsat 8, which is about 900 meters square. So because um, the smoldering uh, still happen in the bush here, the vegetation still there, and there is mixel pixel there. So we can avoid the mixel pixel here as our errors. So the outcome of the first um, innovation is uh, the, the establishment of the topical uh, tropical peatland commission algorithm by using TWIR and SWIR. Um, and the accuracy, we, we have collected about 106 um, ground sampling in Kalimantan, in central Kalimantan and Riau province. Um, we have 100% of uh, detection of flaming, but for the smoldering, just only 73%. Uh, and the omission errors, as I said before, was on the small smoldering area on the mixed mix pixel. While for the commission errors, of course, as the others, um, fire detection algorithm also, um, uh, experience on this commission error. Uh, we have also bright objects or um, settlement as uh, the build, but bright building objects as the commission errors in our algorithm. But uh, our experience by using GIS urban map, we can increase the accuracy up to 93%. Okay, the second one, uh, when we try to assess the fierce active fires by uh, using um, topical, uh, topical fires from Landsat 8 as reference, we have uh, re some result yields here. First, by using single time of hotspot, the probability of detection was only about 70 percent. But if we use daytime and nighttime data within about 15 hours yeah, together, and with the buffer, uh, cluster buffer analysis within 750 meters, for example here, this is the simulation if we have a active fire and then we do some a buffering, and this is a cluster buffer here with a distance 750 meter. We have uh, about 90 the probability of detection was increased by using this method by by combining those daytime and nighttime and doing some clustering. Okay, may I continue or stop because the uh, Azan is <laughs> coming. Pak Arif, apa kita tunggu dulu Azan selesai atau bisa? Boleh, tidak apa-apa Ibu Parwati. Um, kalau ingin ditunggu dulu, bisa dimit dulu. Kita nanti lanjut setelah Azan selesai. Terima kasih. Iya. Yeah. Mohon maaf karena memang uh, apa di bawah nih di kantor ada musola dan <laughs> aja ya. Yeah. Tidak apa-apa ibu. Yeah. <tuh> Oh, 
Okay, now I continue. Um, okay, so uh, the next item is the that the fears, fear active fires actually also can uh, detect small fires, uh, which is about um, 0 0.09 hectare or 900 meters square, which is about one pixel of um, asset data, but the probability of detection is about just only 10 percent so uh, instead of uh, the capability of low spatial data uh, for detecting uh, pit lamp fires by using middle infrared and thermal infrared with their spectral but it still hasn't um, maxim maximized to um, to detect the small fires, it's just only a ten temp. The just larger fires, up to fourteen hectares, for example, the probability of detection is about eighty percent. So uh, this is um, the the summary of uh, the assessment of fears, and we also have a false positive alarm. Uh, in Berlin, about 5%. And of course, uh, as the commission errors uh, was in the industrial area of gas flare and bright rooftop. Okay. So the third one, uh, so here uh, we try to implement the topical algorithm to Sentinel-2. The Sentinel-2 doesn't have tier thermal infrared it just only have sewer short wave infrared which is um, mainly uh, capable just only for flaming flaming detection not appropriate for the uh, smoldering detection but we we here we try we try to implement the algorithm to sentinel 2 and the our accuracy uh, here, just only 35 to 56 percent. Yeah, this is as we we expect. Uh, the theory that a swear cannot uh, maximum maximize to uh, detect small drying, but for the flaming, it has 90 percent. Okay. So this is the example uh, of the algorithm. This one is the uh, the RGB of Landsat images, and the second one is the Sentinel. It just only has nine minutes uh, different uh, for the acquisition time. Okay, and then we try to uh, implement the topical algorithm here using the contextual test here, and this one is by using road masking test. So we 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 have um, still uh, 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 confirmed unconfirmed for the smoldering, but we use the the RGB of planet data, which acquired on the same on the same day and exactly just only three minutes different with the. Uh, Landsat 8 data here. For these areas here, we can see smokes here 
um, emanating from the ground, which is the typical um, characteristic of smoldering fires. Yeah. So in this uh, case, we just only uh, confirm these um, smoldering fires by using other um, images, for example, smoky, smoky, smoky images. And uh, we haven't doing the um, ground validation to this area. Uh, because the limited uh, funding, okay. so, which is uh, will be our consideration to further uh, research. Okay, next slide. Ibu Parwati still have um, two minutes. Yes, uh, I'm actually uh, finishing this. Just only one slide more, but I can't. Uh, do the next slide. Wait a minute. Next. Okay, this one. So our contribution uh, to the remote sensing for fire detection is this algorithm, or uh, which is called as topical from Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2 for pit fires detection, and also the new technique to optimize fierce active fires by multi-temporal analysis and spatial buffering to, to make the efficient of uh, ground validation. And some future works need to be done. Uh, for example, smoldering validation. This can be done by, um, for example, field um, measurement or also by using the other product of satellite images, for example, um, uh, by using soil moisture measurement and smoke um, analysis. Okay, that's all my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Parvati, for um, very interesting uh, presentations. Um, it is, you know, very clear. I think on the research how to um, analyze the um, tropical peatland combustion fire. Um, now, I would love to move to the second speaker. So the second speaker is um, Ibu Dr. Yeni Fetrita. Um, Ibu Yeni is also from Lapan um, and will uh, present on the um, evaluations of uh, multi-sensor data for productions of burn area maps in Indonesia. Um, Ibu Yeni, um, time is yours. Um, then I think I will ask for our operator to share the slides from Ibu Yeni. Mas, tolong dibantu atau mbak? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Pak Arif, can you hear my voice again loud? Yes, it's okay. loud and clear. Um, loud but... and clear. Thank you. So, um, yeah, while, while, while waiting for the uh, presentation loading, I uh, just want to say that uh, what I'm going to talk about just continuing from uh, Dr. Parwari mentioned earlier. Hopefully, I'm not going to make you sleepy <laughs> during my presentation. I prepare for 20 minutes talk, but please, pa Arif, uh, remind me five minutes. Uh, you know, if still five remaining, uh, five, five minutes remaining. Okay. So okay. Uh, is there any, is there any yes. problem? Otherwise, I I, I, I think um yeah. Untuk panitia, mohon dibantu untuk share slide-nya Ibu Yeni di Taman Kota atau operator. Okay, so Ibu Yeni, I, I think it, it appears there already. Right, in the operator BR two, I believe. Right? Exactly. So I, need to, I need to pin it in 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 this. Uh, Okay. okay. All right. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my um, time to speak up a little bit, just continue what uh, Dr. Parvati mentioned. Um, it's really interesting. And today I'm going to discuss uh, how multi-sensory data could be used for production of burn area maps in Indonesian peatlands with emphasizing on assessing seasonality uh, differences. Next slide, please. 
Um, I will begin telling why this research is important and then what the methods used for this uh, study and then um, discussing the, the finding, conclusion, and the future directions. Next slide, please. So with nearly 75% to 80% of Indonesian peatland covered by tropical forests by the year 2020, sorry, 2000, peatlands has been a home for thousands of unique flora and fauna. We heard it earlier this morning session. Not only rich in biodiversity, peatlands uh, have been a carbon storage from both the carbon rich of peat itself and also the above ground biomass grown on the peatland. So here, for example, the peat swamp forest. Since this area itself were not easy to reach due to the wet, um, mucky ecosystem, this area has been lack of human intervention. Next, please. Until human intervene the peatlands by creating canals to drain the land, convert it to the forest into other land cover use, including agricultural uh, land. And human activities have been reported as the root cause of the burning problem. And now this fire resistant areas has changed into a fire prone areas. On these figures, you can see how the land cover uh, type has changed differently. You see the, 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 the right part, depending on how many times the areas has burned. The more frequent fires, the less likely the area return to its predominantly land cover type, the forest. Next slide, please. The so once peat land burned, uh, the sources of emissions do not come only from destroying the peat or the above ground biomass, but all at the part I mentioned earlier. And Indonesia was reported to contribute to global carbon emission by, well, the, the the, the number probably is debating is about 40% of average annual global fossil fuel um, carbon emission in 1997 and five, about 5% five in 2015. I, think I have to think that peatland burning has also caused this serious health impact, the human loss of life and other socioeconomic problems. Next slide, please. And here we can see that the burn location itself is very difficult to access. This is just an example how we reach our study sites. Next slide. And also field assessment are challenging with the wet ecosystem, but very, very dry and dangerous when the drain peat burn. Next slide. When the drain peat burn, it causing smoldering, it's persistent small fires, the heavy smoke and haze, but also the persistent cloud cover was also the most difficult issue to map the uh, areas burn in Indonesian peatland, specifically using satellite-based approach. Next slide, next slide, please. Okay, so today, modest derived burn area product provided a long-term data set. So I would say, if I could recall, this is the only one for now, a long-term data set. This is accurate, you know, the product's accurate for many regions. However, it's a limited assessment for Indonesia. We need fire history. We, we really need to assess the fire history in Indonesia, if you all agree with me. Not only to see the area affected, but also to see the effect of cause by the pit fires itself. Here, for example, the fire history affected the amount of carbon release from pit fires. Next slide, please. Potential for comprehensive burn area mapping increases with the launch of various free data sets. You name it, Landsat 7, 8, and now we have 9, Sentinel 2, Sentinel 1, and Dr. Parati also um, has already investigated VIRS 375 with higher spatial, temporal, and spectral resolution. However, it's only limited studies in this region assess an integration of data from multiple sensors. We heard from Dr. Panji, um, Sanji this morning that we already tried, but only limited. So Next sure. slide. So this is part of my, uh, uh, our research um, that now um, we, we <coughs> did for publication. The question is how can the existing burn air, this the long-term period that we have now, the modest space and moderate resolution imagery from Sentinel-2, Sentinel-1, Landsat, 
and also you know one of the product that um, currently um, investigated which is good in other regions greeted various activifier be used to improve the accuracy of burn area mapping in induction peatlands. The, the specific question is how does the accuracy of existing modest burn area product change between the five seasons of different severity? Is there any policy and development? The second one is to what extent could available um, multi-sensor data, all that we uh, mentioned earlier, to improve burn area estimation in peatlands. Next slide. To answer those questions, we conducted the uh, research in Central Kalimantan, Indonesia. This is only a small part of Central Kalimantan, uh, part of the MRP, the Mega Rice Project. Um, as you can see in the panel A, that's the, how it looked like in 2015. You can see in the, you know, the right um, bottom, the, the top, the corner, the top corner. Um, this barely seen the uh, our study side. But, we, but, but when we compare with uh, 2014, well, it's kind of, let's call it the moderate um, level of uh, burning season. So we still can see our site. Uh, and, and you see that this panel, I'm sorry, I call it B, it should be no B or maybe D. The, um, you can see the average uh, rainfall. You can see that's the, the, the dash line. Uh, that's the, the normal average. And you can see in 20, 15, which is the, the, the gray bar, compared to the 2014, you know, the blue bar, and the 2019, is the line bar. That's, you can see that's really low below, uh, below normal average. So for that, we selected the 2015 as the severe burning uh, season, and 2014 to the moderate burning event. You also can see down there, the, um, the magenta circle shows the last remaining forest of which burn in 2015. So we will look at it later. Next slide, please. We compare uh, two fire seasons of different severity, as I mentioned, 2015 and 14. We first assess MADIS uh, in the last session, read it active fire. And um, for 2015, since uh, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 sensors became operationally available from late September 2015, their outputs were assessed for um, the 2015 uh, burning event only to determine whether they can potentially improve the efficiency found in the MADIS, VIRS, and Landsat burn area product. Next slide, please. Now, here are the data sources and the selection for production of burn area. <clears throat> We use various, um, various methods from a simple approach to the more complex approach using random forest model. We heard this morning, um, Galdi Chul say that it's not single, no single method will be used, I mean, the best one. So I use uh, various methods. The shaded row shows the burn map we derive by ourselves, while the other two uh, were uh, an available product, Modest and Sentinel-1. For 2014 uh, accuracy assessment, we use spot five images of, um, as our reference provided by LAPAN. And for 2015, uh, the comparative accuracy for the five sensor derived product, uh, ground truth data points derived from field data. And then we calculate the overall accuracy, omission error, commission error, and also the regression of burn proportion. Next slide. Um, here is the method to derive a Landsat burn area map. We use a machine learning, a random forest model. We use several indices that found previously for burn area applications, including NBR, NBR2, EVI, SAVI, and SAVI, and also the thermal uh, infrared band. Uh, first, we define the post and pre fire images based on the timing information from the MODIS uh, active fire product. And then from each indices, we calculate the pre and the post fire uh, difference indices. We also selected the maximum brightness temperature of the Landsat thermal band. We use our random forest package to run this model. We pull, pull all of the input into that package. We collected 2000 training points from the images for each year of interest. And then we also investigate the uh, most important variables because this package also allow us to, um, to, to get it. 
And then for the final burn error map, we uh, selected the probability map greater than 0.95. Next slide. And this is um, the way we, um, you know, the method to grid active fire and Sentinel-2 burn area. On the left, you can see the simple way gridded uh, 375 meter active fire uh, raster within the same period of the reference map. On the right, um, you can see our approach to map the area burn form from Sentinel-2A only at the moment due to limited uh, availability of the imagery at the moment. So we just use three images only. We masked the cloud shadow first, and then we drew some polygons to use for initial classification of burn and non-burn classes. We visually interpret these polygons based on our best knowledge. The final burn area map for the whole scene was then classified using uh, only two spectral indices based on our pre preliminary result, the NBR and NBMI, and then we use image segmentation to run, to, to map the, the whole scene. Uh, next slide, please. For Sentinel-1 burn area map, we did not process this uh, data, but we downloaded it from uh, Sentinel-1 Indonesia's uh, 2015 burn area map that was uh, available from the European Space uh, Agency for Climate Change Initiatives. The map was reliable for Indonesia with an overall uh, 80, almost 84% accuracy. Next slide, please. So with the first result, um, yeah, next slide, please. How does the accuracy of existing burn area products change between fire seasons of different uh, severity? Next slide. It's a little bit slow. I don't see this next slide. We are waiting for the slides. We found that the MARIS product accurately detected about half of the burn areas. Oh my gosh, is there any problem with my... Is there any problem with my... Oh. Can anyone hear me? Um, yes, and now I'm I'm seeing the oh. the slide where where you you are presenting the 2014 reference map modis uh, BA 2014 modis BA 2015 and 2015 reference map. Is is that also the oh. slide that you are seeing? Or I'm sorry, I think that's a problem with my connection. So please go back to the result one after the result one. I think I haven't seen your slide also, uh, Ms. Siani, for the whole presentation. Oh. Oh, I, I didn't yeah. see at all. I was saw that you not use uh, uh, slide, I think. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Bagus. I, I think I, I missed that. Uh, I put it on the chat that you need to um, pin um uh, operator BR2. Jadi mesti dipin Pak ya oh, operator okay. BR2 BR2. Mm -hmm. Ada di partisipan Pak. Oh, Partisip okay. namanya so Ya. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Um yeah, shall we get back um Mas atau Mbak panitia yeah, tolong di di dikembalikan di results ini. Result okay. 1. Oke, okay, yang tadi Mas. Okay. Result 1 ya. Yeah. Okay, next this one after this slide please. I'm afraid my connection was poor. Next slide, this one. So let's talk about, okay. Okay, this one. Yeah, we found that the uh, Maris product accurately detected about half of burn areas in 2014. And on the other hand, in 2015, you can see there's only a small dot down there, the blue one. Um, ex because of the extensive smoke cover of the severe 2015. So hardly any burn errors were detected by modest burn error product. Next slide. In 2014, um, VIRS uh, active fire um, surprisingly accurately detected 64% of burn areas with a commission error nearly identical to that of modest 
and Landsat had a very low commission error, but failed to detect 39% uh, of errors burn in 2014 due to persistent cloud cover and much less frequent imaging than modest for uh, VRs. Nice slide. In 2015, combined detection derived from passive sensor MADIS, um, VIRS, and Landsat still missed that's about 37% uh, of the total area run. And addition of VIRS, uh, Actifier, and Landsat absolutely drastically improved upon the MADIS burn area since none of, you know, barely the 2015 event. Next slide. And then the Sentinel one. So surprisingly, I would say, was the most prominent sensor available to map the areas in 2015 for this site, as you can see on the panel F. Combining all the data for uh, the multiple sensors filled the modest burn area gap by 99% in 2015 and about 17% in 2014. Uh, next, please. And then uh, here is the um, regression proportion areas burn for 2014 and 2015. Uh, we found that uh, MADIS underestimated uh, area burn as previously uh, already published in early 2021 by, uh, by us with the last linear distribution. Um, and if you can see, can you see clearly because it's like blur in my screen, but the, the, the black one was the uh, views and the red one was the from Landsat. Uh, we can see yeah, we can see that the various active fire details were comparable to that Landsat. In 2015, uh, we also can see that um, VIRS also uh, the best correlation with Landsat detected only 60% of the total area. So it's only already 17 minutes with this, some problem with my connections. Uh, next slide, please. So the second result, to what extent could the available multi-sensor improve uh, the detection? Next slide, please. Okay, these figures is complicated for me to tell you, but so let me read it. These figures show uh, burn area proportion in Y axis, and in, in, in X as it's showing um, either is how many numbers? Is it one sensor, two sensors, or three sensors? Um, for, since um, 2015 only, we have um, Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1. So to make it comparable, A and B, we compare only three sensors only for 2014 and 2015. You can see the panel A and the panel B. Um, in 2014, uh, only about 25% was detected by all three sensors and another 45% by some combination of two sensors. The remaining 30%, you see the A panel, uh, was detected by only one of the sensors with roughly 10% each from each sensor. And what about the 2015? You can see the panel B. Modest burn area only detected 41 hectares, which is, you can't see anything in, on, on the figure. Uh, you, okay, you also can see that over 40% of burn area came uniquely from one sensor, with over 30% from VIRS Actifier alone. Unfortunately, we can't see the areas as I mentioned. Look at the C1. In 2015, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data became available, okay? And nearly half of the burn areas were detected by three or more sensors. You can see from, you know, the X axis, three, four, five, if we combine it, it's a, a more and detected, while less than 20% were only detected by a single sensor. Sentinel-1 and, Sent and VIRS Actifier were the greatest contributors of unique uh, detection. Next slide, please. I just wanna show you the um, experiment I conducted in order to, si to simulate the need for national monitoring burn area. Here we examine how the date image selection affect the error rate we found that the uh, out of back estimate of error rate was comparable in 2014 and 2015 when all available images used until the end of the year. The last images have suffered from small. We can see the, the you know, the, the panel B, you can see the, the white color that shows that um, um, the cloud covered. So we can't see anything. The last images also decreased the predicted probability of the area being burned. 
This, this implies the message is that for rapid monitoring burn area, monthly product, for example, that currently what Indonesia requested will not be satisfied using less set only. That's why multi-sensory approach are desirable. So next slide. So regardless of the images, the selection, some of the uh, indices are, uh, are important. You can, we can talk about it later, but um, you know, this is the common um, indices, NBR and also NDMI that's based using, basically using a short with infrared and near infrared band. Next slide. This is the critical one. Here are the images uh, of Landsat 7, 8 um, and Sentinel-2 from the early burning season until November 2015. All images are displayed uh, in RGB composite surface reflectance uh, bands with uh, image uh, enhancement to accentuate burn locations. In general, the dark um, red of magenta shows burn scars in um, the Landsat and Sentinel-2 images. Here we want to emphasize that relying on single sensors such as currently has been mainly used by the Indonesian authority, mainly to underreported. You can see down there, they, that's the from Bay, uh, Bay Burn area from uh, Ministry of Pharmacy for, two, uh, for 2015, only based on Landsat 8. Um, however, I know that lately uh, our government has started to employ um, Sentinel-2 in addition to Landsat images. So we also noticed that the only isolated area um, you see down there in the, the down the bottom. We also noticed that the Sentinel one, um, the only uh, Sentinel one indicated as burn area was already clear before the burning began. So this area was located on peace swarm. It means that there is another source of error from Sentinel one that we have to consider with. Next slide. I think we can skip. Next slide, two slides we can skip. Um, I don't think we have time to talk about it. It's freezing. But Arif, can you hear my, can you hear me? Do I lost the connection? Yes, yes, still okay. very clear. And now we are on the slides of fire history and related land cover type. A jump into conclusion. But in my, but in my screen, nothing changed. We are already in conclusion slide. Okay, so just the conclusion. Are you in the conclusion the slide? Okay, let me, yeah, I can't see that, but it's okay. I Let me talk because uh, we have to save some time. So the burn, the, to conclude that burn area accuracy detection varies temporarily. Modest burn area product failed to detect nearly all of the area burned during 2015 due to heavy smoke. While in 2014, the moderate burning event uh, detected just about half of the true burning. The classification attempts using all available Landsat and Sentinel-2 imagery also suffer from cloud and smoke cover in both, both uh, seasons, despite having much higher spatial resolution. Can you go to the next slide for the conclusion? And the Sentinel-1, we can see that worked best during the severe 2015 uh, with no rain, because that's, uh, that's another consideration. The gridded actifier alone from viewers could also be an alternative to mapping burn areas. By combining all the uh, sensors, we found that it can fill the modest, the modest gap by 99% in 2015 and 17% in, 20, uh, in 2014. And then for the future directions, can you go to the future directions, please? Because I can't see that. Uh, let me. But Arif, can you see the future direction slide? Because it's freezing in my side. Yes, Ibu. Hi. <laughs> now I'm okay. seeing. Yeah, we are now okay, on the good. future direction slide. Okay, good. So uh, this is this is the. Um, I'm sorry. Maybe I am. Um, you know, spend more time. The Indonesian government has been using the visual um, detection method to produce the burn area maps, but the method is uh, costly, labor-intensive, and time-consuming. Well, here we recommend to use. The new approaches for more accurate observation and quantification of fires in Indonesian peatland. The study proved that no single sensor could detect the burn in peatlands uh, accurately. Each sensor has a unique capability, but also has the limitation. That's what we noted. 
However, this research was limited to Kalimantan, so we um, recommend to conduct in, in other uh, area, including Sumatra and Kalimantan, sorry, Sumatra and Papua, but not only uh, peatland. We also have to think about lately, um, the consistent burn error is also found in other non peatland, for example, the Nusa Tenggara. Uh, so our assessment will be valuable to find whether all the methods we use are for peatland specific or not. And then there's no single method can be used. I agree with Chulapak. So the simple yet accurate is desirable. The product position is related to the mapping purposes, for example, for either it's for monthly, annually, or even higher accurate for scientific evidence, which also needed. I talked to Dr. Bambang Hero Sahaja, which is also needed. And then um, I also urge the development and integrated supporting platform for monitoring the burning opulence. So for that, I conclude uh, for this research and also all the fundings um, for, for this research. Uh, South Dakota State University, uh, LAPAN, and NASA project, and also Ministry of Research and Technology. By then, I conclude. Thank you. Pa Arif, back to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ibuyeni, uh, for the interesting uh, presentation and apologies for from Pak Panji Mayatar from um, Faculty of Geography uh, at Gajah Mada University to both uh, presenters, to Ibu Yeni or Ibu uh, Parwati. Um, I don't know if you have some sense, uh, what is the use of or how the, um, the optical data or the multispectral um, satellite remote sensing data can be used to um, estimate and carbon stocks and then forest carbon biomass. Um, especially uh, not only the above ground biomass or, or, or above ground carbon stocks, but also the below ground ones. I don't know if um, Ibu Parwati or Ibu uh, Yeni could um, briefly respond to these questions. Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer. So this is, this is such a good question. So, uh, yeah. Here uh, you mentioned about the how the remote sensing satellite can um, estimate or yeah penetrate the uh, ground uh, ground uh, ground surveys and estimating the carbon. So in my um, experience and when I uh, study the literatures. Uh, for the the use of remote sensing for both optical and the microwave data, even though for uh, even for the temperature or the soil moisture estimation, we can only um, estimate or the observe the the surface of the ground of the the, the earth. Um, for example, in this in this case, the, the smoldering that I mentioned is actually just only measure the surface of the uh, the 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 surface of the the area. I mean, just not exactly the uh, temperature uh, underground. So for the um, for for the example of the soil moisture measurement. Um, the use of microwave, for example, the, the best one is for the L band under the um, satisfaction area, for example, the bare line without the canopy of the vegetation. Um, the literature that I have read uh, talk, uh, tell about that it, it just uh, maximize for the root zone only about 30 or 30, 20 to 30 centimeter uh, underground. So uh, we can't uh, measure the ground level of the water uh, in the peatland actually. It just, uh, the, the, the research uh, developed nowadays is try to estimate the ground level water using the surface um, 
the surface measurement of or observation. Uh, in this case, relating to the um, estimating the carbon below the ground, I I don't think that the remote sensing nowadays can um, able to to estimate this uh, below ground. But this is the challenges that we need to face um, while the common uh, or the uh, the, the common method just only mentioned about the above ground, uh, the above ground vegetation or uh, carbon to to estimate to be estimated. Um, that's my opinion for this question. But this is actually a good question for our challenges in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Um, Ibu Parwati, Ibu Yeni, you want to add um, a bit on this? Sure. Yeah, sure. Pak Panji, thank you for the question. So this is a really interesting and really a uh, hot topic, um, I believe. Um, as well as in my, one of our projects with NASA, um, we did only in a, in a small part, as I mentioned, in the study site. But we did we, we do a lot of work there, including, um, you know, uh, measure the bulk, bulk density and everything just to understand how the carbon the carbon storage in, in um, below below ground appear <clears throat> and and yes um dr parati also mentioned if you just rely on multispectral imagery is it effective to make carbon stock probably again if you looking at the multi-sensor the idea of multi-sensor data um dr panji mentioned this morning like you know, it's not only it's, it's multi-dimension if we want to look at that that will be ideal so if you work on only a single one you know the multi-spectral imagery the optical data it may not be you know, satisfied and so um one of the um the idea is to combining for example for now we we, we did the reason why we um try to make a, a fire frequency, you know, the history of burning um, more accurate than what we have now, for example, modest burn area, because one of the um, multispectral data can help us to understand how much the, you know, the carbon below ground there and how much the loss is also from the multispectral images. Um, from the above ground biomass, we understand that the, the relationship between the surface, um, the above ground biomass, and then uh, and then allow it to go deep into the peat. Because you know, when it fires, when fire occur, um, it doesn't mean that fire occur that it suddenly the peat will also be burned. It, it also depends on how much the surface of fuel um, at the moment at the situation and so one of the uh, uh, one of the projects that we use now we, we try to make it some inputs into the model including the fire frequency how many times the area burn and then since um, since this, there's a connection between the canal uh, distance from the the, the peat, uh, so we put it all in the, our, our model, and then we um, lucky we lucky lucky us because we have also lidar data to um, to look at the, the change um, from the previous year and to the let's say for the within you know four years difference. So that's by combining all it will be ideal. I think. Well, I hope it helps you, and um, I hope I can, um, you know, answer your question and satisfy. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Ibiani. So um, let's let's move to the to the next um, speaker, uh, Pak Agus Mariono from Kajamada University. Um, Pak Agus, um, time is yours, Pak. Thank you. Yeah. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, so I'm so sorry. I have. Uh, I have to speak Bahasa Indonesia because this problem is actually nice if I use Bahasa Indonesia. Yeah? Hey, okay. Bapak, okay. Yeah. okay, thank you very much. Menit, Pak, atau yeah. Yeah. Let me um, saya tunjukkan presentasi saya, uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian, karena ini masalah yang sangat krusial dan harus kita selesaikan hari ini. Jadi agar uh, uh, seminar ini itu membawa hasil gitu. 
kita memang sudah cukup untuk berdiskusi tapi realitasnya untuk terjun ke lapangan itu yang masih kurang gitu. Nah, oleh karena itu saya membahas tema ini drone susur sungai cegah banjir bandang. Banjir bandang barusan terjadi ya. Barusan terjadi eh, di Batu dan saya tidak yakin kalau tidak terjadi lagi di beberapa di tempat-tempat yang lain mengingat kita sedang lanina sehingga kita harus melakukan sesuatu supaya bisa mencegahnya banjir bandang itu tidak terjadi. Eh, kita tahu bahwa korelasi perubahan iklim kita sangat tinggi seperti ini, apalagi ini ada lanina 2020, jadi kemungkinan meningkatnya bencana hidrometeorologi. yang harus kita lakukan adalah bagaimana bencana-bencana itu menjadi pengungkit untuk kesejahteraan masyarakat. Dengan adanya bencana, kita semakin sejahtera, minimal kita semakin pandai. COVID sudah membuktikan dengan adanya bencana COVID, temuan-temuan kita banyak. Kurang tinggi menemukan berbagai hal. Demikian juga ini yang terjadi, banjir bandang spesial itu, bagaimana kita bisa mengungkitkan, menjadikan bencana itu menjadi pengungkit kemajuan. Misalnya, <tuh> Bencana menjadi pengungkit pengajian seperti ini, Bapak sekalian. Ilmu pengetahuan, pengetahuan karena bencana naik. Bencana apapun akan membawa kenaikan pengetahuan. Termasuk sekarang ini bencana apa eh, banjir bandang itu ilmu pengetahuan drone kaitannya dengan remote sensing GIS berkembang gitu. Dan itu menjadi sebuah kekayaan luar biasa. Tapi kemudian harus digunakan untuk menyelesaikan kemungkinan bencana yang akan terjadi. Rekayasa teknologi sandang pangan juga akan meningkat daya juang motivasi bangsa untuk menyelesaikan bencana atau mitigasi bencana menjadi tinggi, kemampuan analisis juga semakin tinggi, akurasi semakin tinggi, remote sensing berkembang, early warning system berkembang, sikap tanggap dan peduli masyarakat akan tumbuh, gotong royong dan persatuan untuk membantu yang lain akan tumbuh, menjaga alam dan lingkungan tumbuh. Ini menjadi jadi ketakutan terhadap bencana tadi harus kita rubah menjadi ini, Menjadi semacam ini, kalau itu tidak kita bisa lakukan, maka kita akan lost, gitu. kita kalah dengan bencana itu. Kita tidak boleh kalah, justru menggunakan energi ketakutan itu menjadi sesuatu yang positif untuk mengembangkan diri. Seperti Jepang misalnya, dia mengembangkan berbagai hal setelah terjadi tsunami kemarin. Itu yang mungkin saya maksudkan. Nah, spesial untuk banjir bandang itu 90 persen disebabkan oleh sumbatan pembendungan banyak titik oleh longsoran dan sisa kayu mati. Itu penelitiannya sudah banyak sekali, dan itu penyebabnya. Ada penyebab yang lain, misalnya ada dua uh, uh, banjir dari anak sungai yang bertemu, jadi satu, tapi relatif jarang. Atau ada bendungan jebol, itu juga jarang juga. Bendungan jebol banjir bandang ya di bawahnya. Uh, ada juga karena irigasi jebol atau bendungan jebol itu bisa terjadi. Tapi di Indonesia, dari dari berbagai macam yang ada itu biasanya karena pembendungan di hulu dan jebol, pembendungan bukan bendungan jebol, tapi pembendungan oleh kayu maupun bebatuan maupun longsoran itu jebol. Dan kalau itu yang terjadi, maka sebetulnya bisa dicegah dimitigasi. Gitu. Kemudian rumah, jembatan dan infrastruktur rusak parah karena masa air, kayu tanah dan batu bergerak bersama-sama menghantam jembatan, menghantam rumah-rumah. Dalam waktu singkat banjir bandang lewat, seakan-akan tidak terjadi banjir bandang lagi. Bagaimana menyelesaikannya? Inilah ilustrasi, kalau ada pembendungan-pembendungan kecil dari hulu sampai hilir, maka kalau di hulu jebol, maka pasti banjir bandang terjadi seperti ini. Dan berarti ini kita punya kesempatan untuk mengelola ini semua. Pembendungan di hulu ini bisa dikelola sehingga banjir bandang tidak jadi. Itu yang harus kita lakukan. Nah, Banjir panjang di Batu, Bapak-Ibu sekalian, dari penelitian dari dari banyak, memang ada longsoran-longsoran pembendungan pembendungan dulu yang sudah terjadi mungkin barusan dan beberapa tahun yang lalu. Dan terjadilah seperti ini. Itu seperti hanya banjir panjang di Bohorok juga itu. Di Bohorok saya penelitian di sana tahun 2003 juga seperti itu. Ada lima titik pembendungan oleh kayu-kayu dan beberapa longsor yang menyebabkan Banjir bandang baru 2003, 200 orang meninggal. Kemudian ini banjir bandang di Solok juga demikian. ya Bukti kayu-kayu seperti ini, kemudian banjir bandang di Sumbung Rejo Magelang juga, ya pembendungan kayu-kayu, kemudian banjir bandang di Sentani, ini disinyalir juga karena kayu-kayu bukan. Ya, Bapak-Ibu sekalian, kita jangan kemudian mengarahkan kepada kerusakan hutan saja. Memang kerusakan hutan itu juga suatu yang sangat parah, nggak bagus. Tapi perlu diingat, 
banjir bandang tidak perlu harus ada hujan ekstrim. Memang hujan ekstrim itu sebagai pemicu, tapi tidak mesti harus hujan ekstrim. Hujan biasa saja, tapi kalau kondisinya sudah hujan beberapa hari, semua pembendungan menampung, dan terjadilah bendung yang di bagian atas jebol, akan jebol ke bawah, akhirnya banjir bandang. Tidak ada hujan pun bisa juga banjir bandang. Sering terjadi seperti itu, sehingga tidak semua banjir bandang, kemudian yang disalahkan adalah kesalahan yang yang salah tapi terus salah tapi tidak ada bunganya gitu loh. sehingga kita sehingga mengacaukan cara kita memandang menyelesaikan masalah itu nah ini akan saya sampaikan oleh karena itu cara penyelesaian yang paling gampang yang bisa dilakukan sekarang ini oleh institusi PU BNPB KLHK dan masyarakat desa pemerintah desa adalah susur sungai jika banjir bandang dengan drone atau walk through itu yang bisa dilakukan nah ini adalah Cara-cara nanti bisa disampaikan kepada yang berhak menerimanya atau yang terkait. Memahami ciri-ciri akan berlalu lagi. Ada ciri-ciri akan terjadi banjir bandang. Ya, secara historis sungai tersebut pernah terjadi banjir bandang di masa lalu. Sungai-sungai yang punya karakteristik tertentu, misalnya batuannya masih muda, kemudian tanaman-tanamannya mudah runtuh dan sebagainya, dia tidak terlalu lebar. Dia cuma 3 meter, 10 meter, 20 meter. Sungai Bengawan Solo tidak pernah akan banjir bandang ya. Tapi sungai-sungai kecil yang melewati desa-desa itulah yang berbahaya karena bagian dulu sungai berada pada lekuk tekuk lereng dia tekuk lereng karena energi besar kemudian energi kecil dan pada alur sungai terjal terdapat material longsoran tanah dan berbagai tempat sepanjang alur sungai utama atau anak-anak sungai dan membendung sebagian atau seluruh alur sungai terdapat tumpukan-tumpukan kayu mati lapuk dan tanaman di berbagai tempat sepanjang sungai itu sudah tanda-tanda akan terjadi banjir bandang, tinggal menunggu waktu. Makanya sungai Bahorok itu, itu 60 tahun yang lalu ada banjir bandang. Sungai di yang barusan banjir bandang di Garut itu ternyata 20 tahun yang lalu banjir bandang. Berikutnya banjir sudah berapa empat kali banjir bandang. Itu karena mekanisme seperti itu. Terdapat tebing, tebing curam, alur dan aliran sungai relatif terhalang dan terganggu oleh longsoran kayu melintang yang kadang sudah menyumbat, membendung bagian dari seluruhnya. Jadi bukan sungai utamanya aja, anak sungai yang lain bagaimana gitu. Nah, sekalian ini ada 10 ciri ya, ini nanti bisa dibaca sendiri. Data hujan menunjukkan bahwa sering terjadi hujan ekstrim itu juga sebagai suatu tanda. Atau gempa terjadi di situ. Gempa berarti kalau di tebing sungai menyebabkan instabilitas tebing. Nah, itu akan bisa menyebabkan banjir longsor dan menutup itu semuanya. kemudian <tuh> menemukan sungai yang rentan banjir bandang. Sungai-sungai dan ciri-ciri nomor satu tadi, sungai dari analisa awal diprediksi menyebabkan banjir bandang, biasanya banjir bandang terjadi pada sungai-sungai kecil. 3 meter sampai 30 meter. Kalau sudah lebih dari 30 meter, tidak ada banjir bandang. ya. Sungai besar seperti Wan Solo, Perito, tidak akan banjir bandang. Justru sungai kecil yang masuk di pedesaan 10 meter, itu yang harus diwaspadai. Ya, Kemudian melakukan Waktu susur sungai menemukan kondisi-kondisi di atas, apakah kondisi tersebut ditemu, ditemukan pada sungai yang sedang dieksplorasi susur sungai? Susur sungai harus dilakukan oleh pihak-pihak yang memahami sungai bersangkutan tentang proses jadi alur sungai. Masyarakat mazhab pencinta alam, anak-anak tidak dilarang ikut susur sungai, remaja dilarang, hanya orang-orang yang sudah tahu pemuda dan sebagainya dan harus berombongan dan tidak menyusur sungai itu lewat di tengah sungai, tapi di tebing sungai, tidak di sungai itu, untuk melihat itu. Kemudian dilakukan juga membuat foto-foto dokumentasi wawancara dengan masyarakat, masyarakat akan tahu bagaimana kondisi sungai yang bersangkutan, jika sungai menemukan hal-hal seperti poin di atas yang saya sebutkan, maka penjara mungkin akan terjadi, dan jika syarat-syarat pemicu seperti hujan ekstrim terjadi, maka akan terjadi. Nah, yang pertama, satu yang paling gampang pakai drone, memanfaatkan alat drone itu gampang. Tapi tidak semuanya bisa diselesaikan dengan drone, tapi sebagian besar bisa. Jadi ke titik tertentu kita drone, kemudian naik lagi, kita drone lagi, kalau memang ada tanda-tanda banjir bandang, segera selesaikan. Penyelesaiannya kalau ada sumbatan-sumbatan kayu, kita cari tukang sekalian, kita singkirkan. Kalau ada pembendungan karena longsoran yang besar, berarti ekskavator masuk. Atau kalau ada tanda-tanda akan longsor, kita kasih terucuk bambu dulu. Atau kita siapkan masyarakat di bawahnya untuk eh, apa ekspedisi, ronda, kalau ada eh, bahaya ekstrim, mereka lebih baik yang tinggal di pinggir sungai itu bergerak keluar dulu. Yang kedua, ekspedisi walkthrough of river bank berjalan menyusuri 
merasa kondisi sungai karena ini bisa ini mampala mampala eh, mahasiswa itu bisa diberi tugas dengan dana dibantu oleh sar dibantu oleh relawan naik memang menyusuri sungai-sungai yang ditengarai dia rentan banjir bandang yang melewati desa melewati kota yang tidak besar ya itu perlu atau kombinasi antara walkthrough dengan uh, drone itu tadi nah ini yang drone yang dikembangkan teman saya geografi Pak Barandi Sabto menggunakan drone ini efektif yang kemarin itu Pak Barandi sedang uh, ada pelatihan di Malang nah, kemudian melakukan drone tapi setelah banjir bandang kalau sebelum banjir bandang dia melakukan drone dia akan menemukan, menemukan Jadi ini eh, pemetaannya, kemudian hasilnya mohon maaf, setelah dan sebelum tadi ya. Nah ini banjir bandang terjadi seperti ini ya, Pak Ustaz sekalian. Kemudian ini eh, hasil dari drone citra satelit gabung GIS dengan itu menghasilkan eh, apa hasil yang luar biasa. Yang itu kalau sebelumnya dilakukan banjir bandang akan bisa diatasi dengan melakukan sesuatu. Nah, Bapak sekalian, kemudian apa yang dilakukan di susur sungai itu dokumentasi, ya catatan bahaya, mensejahterakan masyarakat. Sungai itu punya potensi besar sekali untuk wisata. Kalau kita selama walkthrough itu tidak hanya melihat banjir, tapi melihat potensi sungai yang bisa digunakan untuk wisata, bisa digunakan untuk apa itu perikanan, pertanian itu menjadi sangat sangat penting sekali dilakukan atau seluruh tanaman-tanaman langka itu biasanya tersebar di pinggir kanan kiri sungai itu menjadi kekayaan masyarakat setempat untuk bisa melakukan itu. Nah kalau kemudian di waktu itu ketemu seperti ini bagus kalian, ini untung dibersihkan. Kalau tidak bersihkan mungkin jadi banjir bandang ini di Klaten ya, untung dibersihkan. Kalau tidak dibersihkan mungkin menumpuk air banyak sekali dan terjadilah banjir bandang karena hampir seluruh apa lebar sungai itu sudah tertutup oleh ini seresah seperti ini bagus kalian. Nah, aksi antisipasinya bagaimana ya tadi? Saya kira menyingkirkan kayu-kayu, menyingkirkan tumpukan seperti ini. Masyarakat ini menyingkirkan bersama-sama. Ada kayu-kayu seperti ini, mohon untuk di senso, dihilangkan ini. Nah, kalau itu dilakukan akan baik sekali. Contohnya sungai yang ada di Cikeas ini, ini tanamannya sudah banyak sekali yang tumbang di, di sepanjang sungai itu. Makanya banjir ya. Karena hujan dua hari yang lalu masih di situ belum bisa bergerak gitu airnya. Kalau ada hujan besar lagi tentu banjir. Tapi kalau penghalang-penghalang aliran itu bisa dihilangkan, ya maka banjir bandang tidak akan terjadi. Itu sebetulnya sesederhana itu. Tapi ada juga konstruksi pembuat konstruksi kayu, penangkap kayu juga ada di tikungan luar dibuat beton-beton supaya beton eh, ram supaya dia menangkap kayu karena yang berbahaya itu kayunya. Ya, kalau airnya tidak terlalu kayu yang ikut air itu namanya debris flow-nya itu akan menyebabkan berbahaya ke depan. Nah, bagi sekalian, jika semuanya tidak mungkin mah harus dilakukan edukasi dan pemberdayaan kepada masyarakat dengan menerapkan early warning system. Kalau ini memang sudah berat sekali untuk dihilangkan, maka masyarakat yang di diedukasi supaya meninggalkan pada saat hujan ekstrim, kalau ada peringatan BMKG hujan ekstrim meninggalkan tempat atau early warning system dihidupkan lagi. Tapi masyarakat terus diajak agar mereka sadar bahwa mereka tinggal di daerah bahaya banjir bandang. Nah, ini perlu disosialisasikan. Jika sudah diantisipasi ternyata tidak ada banjir bandang, tidak ada hujan ekstrim, tidak maka ya perlu disyukuri. Alhamdulillah, masyarakat sudah tahu teritorialnya dari hulu sampai hilir bahwa sungainya baik tidak ada ancaman banjir bandang, tidak longsor, ada tempat-tempat untuk wisata, ada tempat yang lain yang bisa digunakan sebagai wisata itulah yang disebut kesejahteraan. Jadi walkthrough tadi not only for flash flood tapi juga untuk meningkatkan awareness juga mencari potensi positif. Ya itu kira-kira bapak sekalian. Nah peserta susur sungainya ini wakil komunitas sungai harus ada, wakil pemuda desa ada, mapala perguruan tinggi, babinsa TNI diajak, wakil punggo desa, tukang dan pembantu tukang ajak lima orang nanti kalau ada kayu-kayu melintang langsung dinas bu bbd dan klhk ya alat yang digunakan alat potong kayu alat ikat dan tarik alat ta alat tanah cangkul skop alat ukur alat dokumentasi alat tulis gambar perlengkapan survei keselamatan kerja 
Uh, hasil susurnya dokumentasi kondisi alur sungai yang dan sembaran sungai, foto, video, gambar, ini jadi kekayaan masyarakat setempat. Oh, dia baru tahu sungainya. Ada masyarakat yang belum pernah ke hulu itu banyak sekali. Nggak tahu hulu itu seperti apa. Ini suatu yang sangat luar biasa. Perlu kita edukasi. Catatan ciri-ciri adanya potensi banjir bandang ada. Catatan potensi bahaya longsor. Catatan potensi positif. Hidrologi, ekologi, morfologi, sosial budaya, kelembagaan, dan peraturan formal. Potensi komunitas sungai sepanjang alur sungai yang akan menjaga melihara sungai. Ya. Nah ini saya kira, kalau ini ada salah satu contoh, dulu sering banjir bandang, kemudian diadakan walkthrough ini di sungai di Ambon, namanya Sungai Batu Bulan, tidak pernah banjir bandang lagi, karena setiap ada pembendungan dibersihkan oleh orang-orang ini, teman-teman komunitas ini. Jadi menjadi cantik sekali tempatnya. Uh, sorry, sorry. Back. Ya. Terus. Nah ini kalau... Ini juga disusur sungai di Klaten, kemudian digunakan untuk wisata. Tidak pernah banjir bandang lagi. Tidak banjir bandang. Sebelumnya saya nggak tahu ya. Ini ya, ya seperti inilah kondisinya itu. Ya. Semua sungai akan bersih, alami dan sehat, tidak jadi banjir bandang dan mensejahterakan masyarakat. I think that was what I want to explain you. Thank you very much. Thank you Pak. Stop ya. Net itu Pak. Yeah. So, thank you. Terima kasih Pak Agus Mariono. Um, thank you for the presentation. I think this is very exciting and 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 also interesting. Uh, kalau biasanya kita mengenal ada namanya participatory uh, forest management gitu ya atau forest mapping. I think this is you know similar concept but actually to participatorily uh, manage our own rivers and our own streams. Jadi okay. Yes, yes. Set, set. So I, I think this is very interesting um, approach, Pak. But um, I'll move to um, to our um, final speakers, um, um, prominent speakers, uh, Ibu Dr. Harkunti, uh, will present um, on the topic of... Uh, I, I, sorry, but okay. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, I haven't seen your 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 slide here. I'm sorry. Okay, but... actually, I have sent uh, to the committee yesterday, <laughs> but maybe they couldn't open. Maybe I'll just share now, if you don't mind, Pak. Sure, sure, Ibu. So, okay. uh, floor is yours. Oops, sorry. Hmm. Okay. Uh... Moderator, also I would like to say hello to all my colleagues, Pak Agus, and as well as all the audience who has still awake until the last uh, the last time. I know this is very late evening, so I hope everybody still have time or energy to listen what I would like to share. So actually, my presentation here that I would like to talk is about the role and challenges of hazard assessment for developing resilient coastal city in Indonesia. Oops, sorry. Yeah. As everybody must aware that this is a situation of the, the landscape of the hazard which is occur in Indonesia. You can see here that all these natural hazard, especially flood, landslide, hurricane, drought, etc., they have, you know, like the high frequency still dominated by flood, which is already explained by Pak Agus Mariono. So, but you can see here, even the tsunami also is very low frequency in the last 100 years, but you can see the highest core casualty actually is due to the 2004 tsunami, which is, uh, you know, induced by the earthquake occur in Simelu, but we call this Indian Ocean tsunami. But by province, you can see here, the domination of the frequency of the occurrence of the, you know, natural disaster. You can see this still mostly in the, you know, the very highly density, density cities. For example, city and regency in Java, and then North Sumatra, as well as the Papua. Uh, no, Papua. I'm sorry, is a uh, uh, Andal. Uh, sorry, uh, Nangro Aceh Darussalam, etc. So this has become a homework if we try to look at the what happened on the di uh, dispersion of the COVID-19 pandemic. We can see here that the pandemic, which is dominated mostly in the big city, and Java still take the role in how we need to combine in the hazard assessment using the multi-hazard assessment, not only the natural hazard, but we need also to think that what happened if during pandemic, like Pak Agus just mentioned, 
there is a disaster occur. That's why the approach of multi hazard should be considered. What happened? What what we should do during the pandemic if we have a uh, such a uh, you know natural disaster? And then you uh, other challenge actually is that need to be faced by most of us in the disaster reduction. Uh, you know, expert or disaster reduction. Uh, you know, uh, practitioner that we we understand here the the type or the you know the phenomena of the natural disaster actually has changed you know not only the tradition that we know about tsunami tectonic tsunami but remember back 2018 especially in september and december 2018 that the tsunami that was the first time for us is actually generated by the collapse of the gunung anak krakatau uh, caldera and as well as the first time that we can see the liquefaction in Palu that time is, you know, that flow liquefaction, which is moved like the whole village to another village before we only know the local liquefaction. And maybe we can still hear in our mind here that the last time that we have tropical cyclone, which is hit our brothers and sister in Nusa Tenggara Barat, as well as Nusa Tenggara Timur. The warning has been issued, but the issue here is not only issuing the warning, but the readiness and responsiveness of the local government toward any warning has been disseminated to them, which is a very low. There is a lot of issue here, the low, the low response or lack of response of this local government and disseminating information to the community because of lack of socialization, also lack of readiness of the government itself. So I would like to highlight here that we are living in the ring of fire. You can see here, this is Indonesia allocated on the, you know, the meeting point of this floor, floor plate uh, of continent as well as the ocean basin. So this is, you can see that we are sitting on the, you know, a hot seat of the uh, tectonic uh, activity as well as which is generated also for tsunami. You can see here the subduction area, which is become, you know, the joint between the plate tectonic as well as the ocean tectonic which generate a lot of energy and we are expecting if there is a big earthquake occur in those region will generate a big tsunami or mega tsunami that was the on the right uh, of my uh, presentation but if you can take a look on the left side here this is the picture actually has give me inspiration this picture actually has been revealed by national geography back 2005 2005 but the most important here that I would like to highlight that they understand that the position of Indonesia, what we call here the west coast of Sumatra, the south coast of Java, and some other area in Indonesia, like for example, uh, Sulawesi, as well as east coast of uh, Kalimantan, actually is very prone towards tsunami. They, they said but this is the tsunami risk index. It's only based on the global tsunami sources, but the other parameter which make us become more vulnerable part of this risk index because the population density in this coastal area. And then because of that situation, we know also based on our you know, national action plan for the 2010 and 2014, that we understand almost two thirds of the coastal area in Indonesia are exposed to the high risk of tsunami. So this has become the homework for us, how we can develop the city which is resilient towards tsunami and how is the role of the hazard assessment in developing those city and as well uh, in line with this uh, theme of the seminar uh, or international seminar which is hosted by Lapan that we would like, I would like to share here, how is the role of the risk assessment using the GIS. And then beside to, uh, before to go to more company already highlight also that the risk yeah, for the insured risk, uh, risk area is about 1,600 insured risk area. This will be because if the South Java megatrust occur, tsunami, uh, occur, which is generate a huge tsunami, so the loss might be about almost 22 trillion rupiah. So this has become a big homework. The company, for example, Maipa Cree Insurance, already highlighted this issue. But what about us now? Shall we do nothing? And then if what happened, if the big thing or the big tsunami occur. So to begin here, I would like to remind everybody. So this is everybody must be familiar with that disaster matter is humanity issue. But 
we are not talking only only the disaster response, but we need to prepare the city, prepare the community, prepare all the stakeholders to be ready to face for the future disaster. That's why we would like to highlight here the risk is possible consequence, but disaster actually something is already happened what we call here actual com actual consequence so because of this issue myself with all my colleagues what we call here the pool of expert for indian ocean which is consists of all my colleagues in the indian ocean as well as all the practitioners on the global that we try to make the guideline for tsunami risk assessment on mitigation for the indian ocean this guideline actually has been published 2015 basically to give the guideline for all the country in the Indian Ocean, how they can make the assessment for the tsunami hazard, and then how they can make the vulnerability assessment, and how can they make the preparedness assessment to evaluate their risk profile. So not only relying what just has been shared by National Geography, but we need to do more detail for making the city more resilient, so we know much better what is the situation of the risk profile of each cities or Regency in the coastal area. So after having this risk profile, next is for sure, you can do the tsunami disaster risk reduction. You can do risk transfers through uh, insurance, or you can prepare for the early warning system or improve the city preparedness toward any tsunami. But the issue here, how could we identify the tsunami hazard itself? Because we need to identify whether your city maybe has high medium low or no risk at all so this has become important how we can identify this so i give you some of the another uh, insight that why we need to make the hazard assessment especially for the disaster natural disaster or multi-hazard uh, disaster actually this is because of our commitment the global commitment for the sendai framework of action here that first is you need to understand disaster risk without having understanding disaster risk, without having the hazard assessment, and then without having vulnerability assessment and capacity assessment, for sure you cannot do other priority. So the basic priority is first understanding your risk. And then I would like to hear is reflection of what happened in Indonesia on the disaster tsunami 2004. I just would like to remind everybody this has happened, the deficit that impact during tsunami 2004, there were tsunami in recorded history in Indian Ocean, especially what we call here mega disaster. The magnitude we categorize as the long lasting earthquake is about 10 minutes. You can understand here how is the impact of the shaking, not only ruining all the infrastructure, all the housing, but also generate the mega tsunami. 2030 people confirmed death in the, from the 14 country of the Indian Ocean. 170 alone from our country. And then this is due no existence of tsunami warning system and then severe damage to ecosystem. Because of that, I would like to uh, highlight here that tsunami 2004 actually become a wake up call for Indonesian tsunami warning system. I'm part because I'm here, there is uh, some friends also from Lapan and from uh, myself and some other from ministry, we are joining the task force to develop tsunami warning system. We divided on the right side, you can see that component of tsunami warning system. During that time, the grand scenario is, uh, we divide it into structure or culture, or we call it upstream and downstream. But during the same time, the uh, UN under this is, uh, during the one of the, uh, you know, world meeting, that they divide, decided to establish what they call people center tsunami early warning system which is composed of risk knowledge, monitoring, warning, and services, dissemination and communication, response capability. I would like to highlight here, risk knowledge is become the first. So if we try to compare between this approach, we understand the risk knowledge should be under the responsibility of the downstream. So the downstream itself based on the, you know, scenario of Indonesian tsunami early warning system is become responsibility of the local government. But the problem here, the diversity of the capacity of local government, the diversity of tsunami risk level, the diversity of readiness has become a big issue. So where could we start? So this has become the challenge for us. So I would like to highlight here, on the, I just focus on the downstream. I'm not talking about the upstream. If you are talking on the downstream here, 
how we need to make the hazard assessment before we talk about the risk assessment, before we can talk to make the evacuation planning. The most important issue here, we can do the plan evacuation planning, we can build the resilient city if we can have the hazard assessment. The issue here for the hazard assessment about the resolution of your scale. The resolution of the map itself is become important. If you cannot use the map one to one to ten thousand or one to twenty five thousand, is on the scale of the city. But you need to be more detailed. The ideal here is one to five thousand, or more ideal again if you have one to one thousand, because otherwise you cannot have the you know sensitizing the information of the hazard exposed to the community itself to the local government before they can decide any intervention for the disaster reduction. Talking again, if you're talking about tsunami early warning system, it's really complex. So it may every, I just believe everybody understand if there is a warning system issue and then who's gonna blame the government. But eventually, if we understand the concept of tsunami early warning system, there's a share of liability here between not only the government, but all the pentahelic that has been also elaborated by Pagus here. So I would like to highlight here, the most important here, preparing the people, preparing the city through evacuation planning, for sure, evacuation planning back again, that we need to conduct the good risk assessment, as well as how we can have land use plan. So for example, here that we conduct uh, back 2007, uh, I was uh, the, you know, the national coordinator for tsunami uh, warning, uh, tsunami, uh, sorry, national tsunami drill. This is a kind of testing the tsunami warning system of Indonesia that the tsunami exercise actually is showing the partnership between all the pentahelix, at least triple helix, the government, private sector, because this is happened in Chilegon area, which is highly dense by the, all the industry and also the people. But to conduct this, we need a good tsunami hazard assessment. Otherwise, we cannot make the good planning and all people will be exposed. Just give you the idea in talking about the tsunami exercise, which is how is the role of the hazard assessment for the exercise itself here in Padang and then also in Bali as well as in Banten, Chilegon. Sorry. And then for Chilegon here, the role of this hazard assessment, how is the importance of GIS here? That, you know, if you are talking multi-hazard scenario, for example, for the case of Chilegon, which is exposed not only to earthquake and hazard eh, and tsunami, but also exposed to what we call industrial disaster and technological failure. That's why during that time, we try to integrate all the information here using uh, the GIS, how we can map the modeling of tsunami, and then how is the impact of the technological and industrial hazard. And we have an integrated map based on this, all the multi-hazard approach. You know, for the tsunami, for sure, we are using, you know, the modeling of tsunami and then how tsunami inundated the area. And you have to, like I mentioned before, that we need to have the high resolution of the, you know, topography. But for the technological industrial hazard, we need a different thing that we need the wind because the wind will carry all the explosion, all the dust of the you know, radioactive dust. And also we can inline that most of the impact of the industry will be carried by the tsunami inundated the area. So this is the important also uh, based on what we did in Chilegon that the critical collateral hazard should be mapped also. For example, there are about uh, you know, 26 chemical ports most of the industry, they have not only chemical industry, but the chemical port where all the, you know, the material of the chemical will be put in the warehouses. And then you can see the terminal warehouses and then the problem also related with transporter and high frequency of this transporter. So this collateral hazard should be mapped also into our risk or hazard assessment. So it's not only simply we have the inundation of tsunami, simply to have like, you know, how the wind direction, but we need to understand the behavior or the phenomena of this uh, collateral hazard due to the earthquake, tsunami, as well of the impact of the wind. So, so this is what we did back 2006, eh, sorry, 2007. We model the, the location of the 
earthquake which generates tsunami just near you know what we call this a mega trust of Sunda Strait and then this has been inundated the all the region of industrial area and then we try also to map how is to make the evacuation mapping so people will understand before making tsunami map you can have to so to see about how bad is the inundation to that area how bad is the impact of the industrial hazard to that area so after that you know the local government they don't understand about this map but we have to make more simply that this is that they need to do how they can evacuate all the workers in the area and all the community living near the industrial zone and then another thing that i would like to share here the challenges of hazard assessment in evacuation planning you maybe everybody remember this picture is become phenomenal this is happened 11 april 2012 there is an earthquake in the same epicenter like 2004 people in the Bada Aceh panic and then you can see on the bottom be, uh, on the below the below of my picture here only few people went to the vertical evacuation shelter the problem here why they didn't move and then to evacuate and then eventually those evacuation shelter has been built in the ground zero in the tsunami uh, which is impacted by 2004 tsunami but people you know what they do here they just flocking and then they just very panic and they bring the car based on our socialization and design they cannot bring the car they cannot bring the, the motorcycle because it will be congested and, and the, luckily the tsunami only occurred 80 centimeters so everybody safe but lesson learned that we need to have really scientific judgment how we can calculate all this evacuee from the secondary evacuation route go to the primary evacuation route we need to calculate the exposure of the people how many people at risk living in the area how is the social demography and we put everything into the map so we can have better evacuation planning so this has become a critic lesson learned during a uh, tsunami tohoku i was there that tsunami tohoku actually before 2011 all of the design of the city in Regency in hazard map. So magnitude eight of the earthquake and from the you know, Hokkaido until Okinawa, they are using this and then it depends on the, you know, the segment of the, you know, the coastal crest of the tsunami itself. But you can see what happened in 2011. So the, you know, it's happened about 9.0 or 9.1 magnitude and all area was inundated. So we are talking here, the challenge of the risk assessment. We need to have better scenario. You're not talking about just, just make assessment, but we need to have better scenario. What magnitude or the maximum magnitude that we are using for the design because it's with give us very critical implication. For example, here in Japan, they put all this uh, critical facility, for example, public school and nursing hospital already in the safe area, but they are using eight magnitude. This is in Wakabayashi Ward in Sendai City. And you could imagine if they already have it on the, what you call this, uh, magnitude nine, they understand how they can prevent and how they can prepare all this critical fac facility to respond. For example, if you got chance to see this in Sendai area, the public school 100 percent student and teacher are safe because they are evacuated to the fifth floor maybe you can you can see here most of the building in japan especially the school they're not using lift they have even though four five story they just have to use food to train themselves how to evacuate and to build the strong pit to go up but for the nursing hospital they are failed to evacuate all the elderly because of the collapse of the you know electricity and then most of them cannot be evacuated and then we we'll, we lost a lot of them uh, during the tsunami 2004 uh, 2011 one thing that i would like to highlight here the most important here how we can change the tsunami hazard assessment into the planning itself there are actually seven you know principle of tsunami knowing your risk and then how you can do risk avoidance and how you can do risk taking through relocation and then through implementation of the building code through the protection of existing building through the strict criteria for building and also the evacuation planning however 
you can implement the seven principle of the land use plan if you have good risk assessment, good resolution of the assessment. So talking about resolution, this is the most important otherwise because we're gonna have you know a problem in having very very you know very clear idea how we can implement. For example, the the difference of the resolution itself give us a big difference. You know, one meter will be make a huge difference on the field. That's why resolution in GIS is become more important. So this is my last slide. Actually, myself with my colleagues in ITB has been asked by BNPB to prepare several technical guidelines to make the hazard assessment and then to prepare evacuation planning. Thank you very much. I hope this uh, can give you an idea from the perspective of earthquake and tsunami. Thank you. I return to you, Pa. Thank you for, for the exciting presentation. I think uh, we have you know very good match here. The first two presentations on peatland fires and, and the last two present presenters um, are on the natural hazard assessment. So um, I have here already from the audience uh, from Pak Yohandi, PVMBG, a questions for Pak Agus Mariono. Bapak, pertanyaannya adalah bagaimana memaksimalkan potensi drone untuk memetakan area atau jalur banjir bandang. Dalam prakteknya, jalur banjir bandang bisa sangat jauh. Silakan Pak Agus. Apakah Pak Agus masih ada? Oke. Okay. Um, Mungkin Pak Agus sudah leave ya, Pak Agus. Baik. Uh, ini kemudian saya bacakan juga pertanyaan selanjutnya ini umum dari Pak Agus Hidayat. Uh, so, basically, um, the question is about the applications of artificial intelligence. Um, this is a general question for all presenters, and I would invite Ibu Harkunti untuk uh, merespon terlebih dahulu Ibu um, how how the artificial intelligence could actually help your work help help, help you know the um, analysis of natural hazard uh, assessment I think if you could just briefly elaborate um, very general and I, yeah. I believe it's useful. okay yeah yeah uh, thank you Pak Arif yeah, actually, this is very important question that for the Indonesian early warning system actually now has been changed and then they are using the 4.0. What does it mean by uh, tsunami warning system 4.0, which is relying on the artificial intelligence as well as the big data. So this is become, because we need to have a very quick, accurate and then, uh, you know, for uh, disseminating the warning. The problem here is not only us because we have also like Indian Ocean, we have another two country become tsunami service provider. They're not ready with this 4.0, but Indonesia take lead to have this 4.0 relying on the artificial intelligence. Other issue here, if you are talking on the downstream, which is more on my work, we need to have this artificial intelligence, definitely, because you, you want to make a decision making, especially how to evacuate the people how many people, you know, because we need to have, you know, a good, a yeah, good decision making system with the help of artificial intelligence, actually, it will help us to have more precise, more accurate number of people which need to be evacuated. And then we have, we, you know, uh, not only talking, uh, arti I mean, artificial intelligence, but, you know, now we are talking about the era digital, right? Because like, for example, in making the vulnerability assessment, what we can do here, we can use what the existing data that already emerged by the, what you call this, the public data. For example, the Google Street Map. We can use the Google Street Map also to identify how is the situation on this region look like, how many buildings, what kind of building is surrounding. So I think this is very important if you are talking about the data from the satellite image combined also with the, you know, the, the real data, you know, uh, using this, like, for example, using the Google Street Map. So we can have you know, more accurate numbers of people at risk. So not only the number based on the, what we call here, the, you know, the what, uh, statistic, but, yeah, but we can have the more real-time data so that will be much better for the decision maker and the city itself. 
hopefully this is answer the question. Thank you, Ibu. Very clear. Um, Ibu Yani uh, and Ibu Parawati, if you would like to um, add some more. Baik, Pak. Mohon izin. Silahkan. Ya. Uh, barangkali uh, bisa saya jawab dengan bahasa Indonesia aja ya dulu ya, Pak ya. Tidak apa-apa ya. Boleh, Ibu. Ya, boleh. Oke, okay, uh, baik menanggapi uh, pertanyaan dari Pak Agus untuk bagaimana bisa mengimplementasi model AI ini uh, ke depan, terutama dalam apa dalam kasus saya adalah untuk deteksi kebakaran di lahan gambut. Jadi ini uh, sebenarnya uh, riset yang saya lakukan ini ini menjadi modal dasar ya untuk ke uh, apa pengembangan dapat dikembangkan dengan pemodelan di AI ya, karena eh, pertama-tama kita harus mengetahui dulu karakteristik lahan gambut yang terbakar dari nilai-nilai spektral yang telah saya sampaikan tersebut, dan itu akan menjadi sampling training yang yang harus kita confirm dulu sebelum kita masukkan ke dalam model AI. Ya, dari, dari sini eh, pemodelan AI seperti kita ketahui bersama bahwa itu akan sangat tergantung lah sekali dengan sampel-sampel training yang akan kita masukkan. Jadi kita harus confirm dulu dengan uh, training sampel yang akan kita masukkan. Dan di sini menjadi modal dasar bagaimana penentuan training sampel untuk dimasukkan ke dalam model AI. Jadi ini potensi uh, sekali Pak, bahkan saya juga berencana untuk melanjutkan penelitian ini untuk menggunakan model AI. Apakah itu bisa menjadi lebih efisien ataukah lebih baik? Itu uh, akan kita coba buktikan dengan uh, di penelitian selanjutnya. Gitu. Terima kasih, Pak. Terima kasih, Ibu Parwati. Um, Bu Yani mau menambahkan atau tidak? Ya. Jawabannya silakan. Iya, menyambung dengan Bu Parwati, pakai bahasa Indonesia kan seperti kebanyakan orang Indonesia juga. Jadi, uh, betul kata Bu Parwati, saya mungkin tadi ada slide yang terlewat, jadi ada yang sudah kami lakukan, Bapak. Kita kalau dipertanyakan tadi adalah apakah kita bicara tentang hutan gitu ya. Jadi kalau saya bilang kami mengaplikasikan ini untuk melihat kebakaran yang sudah mengakibatkan hutan itu hilang, gitu ya. Jadi kita memetakan area yang sudah terbakar yang dulunya adalah predominantly forest, gitu kan di daerah yang ini. Itu paling tidak kita bisa melihat itu. Dan yang sudah kami lakukan menggunakan AI itu, kita pakai machine learning salah satunya. Kita sudah cobakan itu, kita mencoba membandingkan itu dengan kalau bisa simpel saja bagaimana gitu ya. Kalau pakai simpel saja tidak pakai AI atau machine learning. Dan ternyata justru karena kompleksnya ekosistem itu membuat banyaknya input variable, termasuk di gemen Ibu Parwati tadi bilang, dan uh, apa itu bisa kita masukkan, itu kelebihannya begitu. Sehingga membuat uh, kita semakin pede, kalau dibilang itu jadi semakin banyak dimension yang kita bisa lihat dari ujung sini-ujung sini, kita minta komputer, kita latih komputernya, uh, kita latih kom, uh, komputernya untuk melihat, uh, untuk melihat bahwa ini daerah terbakar dari sampel-sampel sampling, sampel-sampel yang kita ini juga mengalaminya, saya sendiri melihatnya bahwa hasilnya dengan akurasi yang jauh lebih baik dibandingkan kita hanya menggunakan single input kira-kira begitu Pak. Jadi um, AI untuk ke depan ini akan semakin semakin uh, menjanjikan gitu ya. Dengan uh, salah satunya juga tadi ada slide yang saya terlewat juga ada beberapa tahun yang kita running gitu. Jadi kita mulai dari satu tahun tetapi kemudian menggunakan tidak manusia lagi yang menjadi utamanya tetapi bisa dibantu oleh um, komputasi dengan yang lebih uh, otomatis. Kira-kira begitu Pak Arif. Terima kasih Bu Yeni. Terima kasih. Saya pikir cukup jelas dan um, kita sudah di penghujung acara untuk yang hari pertama ini. Um, sebelumnya saya mengucapkan terima kasih yang sebesar-besarnya kepada Ibu Parwati Sofan, Ibu Yeni, Fetrita, Pak Agus Mariono, dan Ibu Harkunti Pertiwi Rahayu, empat presenters kita, Bikranov Klaus. Terima kasih Ibu dan Bapak sekalian. Um, saya pikir uh, waktunya sudah, saya sudah mengambil 9 menit lebih banyak daripada yang yang kami rencanakan. Hanya mengumumkan saja di menit terakhir bahwa besok itu jam 9 akan ada sesi bukan sesi lanjutan tapi akan ada dua uh, workshop gitu ya uh, dua tema yang berbeda yang per- pertama ini temanya terkait uh, machine learning teknik using Python for remote sensing land cover applications ini Pak Kustio dari Lapan Brin yang akan menjadi trainernya uh, kemudian training yang kedua yang bisa Bapak Ibu ikuti juga itu adalah on land use land cover classification using uh, Google Earth Engine ini oleh 
uh, kolega kami Fadri Ramdhani dari BR Indonesia. Um, silahkan nanti linknya saya pikir sudah sudah diumumkan oleh uh, panitia juga begitu. Saya mewakili panitia um, uh, dari uh, apa dari dari acara konferensi atau simposium ini mengucapkan terima kasih yang sebesar besarnya kepada bapak dan ibu sekalian. Mudah mudahan bapak dan ibu masih berkenan untuk bergabung di training workshop uh, esok hari. Kepada Bu Yeni, Bu Parwati, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, saya mengucapkan terima kasih. Selamat sore. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Salam sehat. Terima kasih. Terima kasih, Pak Ari. Pak Ari.